In the previous video, we set up a basic root yaw offset system to counter rotate the root bone of the character skeleton so that the character can remain facing forward while we rotate the camera around it. In this video, we'll be implementing turn in place animations that will be used to back out this root yaw offset. We'll be playing turn in place animations when the difference between the root yaw offset and the facing direction of the camera is great enough that we wish to rotate to realign the character with the camera, such as the position that the character and camera are in now, where the camera is pointed towards the front of the character. In this situation, the character would want to turn around completely and face forward to prepare for, well, movement input. We'll begin in the idle locomotion layer, where I will go ahead and create a state machine. I will name it idle sm and I'll connect it into the output pose. I'll go ahead and cut to the looping sequence player that we have playing an idle animation. I'll create a new state in the state machine named idle, and I will place that sequence player into it and connect it up. For this turn in place system, we're going to have two states, one called turn in place entry, and one called turn in place recovery. A turn in place animation really has two phases. One where the character is actively rotating and another where the character is settling into the idle pose. There are going to be some cases where we want to play one turn in place animation then another because the player's camera rotation input can pretty rapidly change. So if the character decides to look the other way while we're playing a turn in place animation, we'll want to then play another after that animation. And instead of waiting for the full settling phase of the current animation to finish before we enter back into a new animation, instead, if we play the first part of a turn in place animation in one state and the second part in another, we can always have a transition from that second recovery state back into the entry state so that we can more quickly realign the character. I will bring your attention to a curve here called turn yaw weight. It is given that name because it does play a role in the function we'll be creating to back out the root yaw offset while the character turns, but we can also use it to determine which part of the animation we are in. These curves have been added to all of the animations in the UUS animation set, and this turn yaw weight curve is also present in all of the Lyra turn in place animations if you are following along with those. There is also a remaining turn yaw curve here, which is the curve that we'll be using to back out the character's rotation. Again, this curve is present in all UUS turn in place animations and all of the Lyra turn in place animations. To add the curve manually to an animation that does not have it, we can go ahead and add an animation data modifiers window and get the motion extractor modifier. We can have it extract rotation on the Z axis and we can apply it. And that is going to give us a curve here. It is moving in the wrong direction though. So what we can do is add a math operation and give it a modifier of negative one. If I delete the root rotation and apply the modifier again, we have a proper curve here that we can rename to remaining turn yaw. This animation and the others that we'll be using already have this curve, so I'll go ahead and delete it off and close out of this window, but I did want to show you guys that process just in case you were following along with your own different animations that do not ha yet have a remaining turn yaw curve. The turn yaw weight curve is probably most easily keyed in by hand once you have a remaining turn yaw curve added. As you can just see when the turn yaw levels out and when it does, that's when you can make that transition from a value of 1 to 0. Back in our idle state machine, I'll go ahead and create the transitions between these states that we have here. There will be a transition from idle to turn in place entry, 
and a transition between both turn and play states so that we can enter into either from either state. So one from recovery to entry and one from entry to recovery. And finally, a transition from turn and place recovery to idle. I'll go ahead and enter into the transition rule between idle and turn and place entry. Here, we're going to get to the absolute value of our root yaw offset and check if that is greater than a threshold. I'll go ahead and get a property access node. I'll get our main animation blueprint and I'll get our root yaw offset variable that we created in the previous video. I'll get the absolute value of this variable and I'll check if that absolute value is greater than 50. I'll plug that into the return value. I'll select this transition role and I will promote it to a shared transition named turn in place. And for the transition between turn in place recovery and turn in place entry, I will use the shared turn in place transition rule. Next for turn in place entry to turn in place recovery, I'll go ahead and get a get curve value function. This will try to read the value for the input curve name from a curve in the animation currently being evaluated. So I'll go ahead and type in turn yaw weight, which is the name of that curve that start at one and go down to zero. And if turn yaw weight is nearly equal to zero, then we will transition from turn in place entry into turn in place recovery. Finally, we have our last transition, the one between turn in place recovery and idle. For this, we should be able to mark it as an automatic rule based on sequence player and state, which will transition automatically once a sequence player has reached the point in time where the remaining time left in the animation sequence matches the duration of the transition. Now I'll begin to fill out to the actual states of our idle state machine, starting with the turn in place entry state. I'll go ahead and create a sequence evaluator. I'll set its sequence to be dynamic as well as its explicit time. And I'll plug that in. Setting these values to be dynamic will allow us to set them in functions we bind to the anim node. I'm also going to set this node to not loop by disabling should loop and when this node becomes relevant, we will, with a new function named setup turn in place anims, set up our turn in place anims. I'll also create a function bound to the update binding of this anim node, which will be named update turn in place anims. Finally, I'll create a binding to the output animation pose of our turn in place entry state. It'll be bound to the on become relevant binding and it will be named set up turn in place entry state. I'll start with this set up turn in place entry state. When we enter into our turn, we want to determine what direction we wish to turn in so that we can figure out if we want to play a leftward turn animation or a rightward turn animation. To do this, I'll get a property access node, get our main animation blueprint, and get our current root yaw offset. I'll go ahead and check the sign of this by passing it through a sign function. And we are going to use the result of this evaluation to set a new Boolean variable named should turn CCW for counterclockwise. With that done, we can back out and enter into our setup turn in place anims function. I'll go ahead and right click and get a set sequence with inertial blending node and I'll get to the one corresponding with the sequence evaluator, not a sequence player. I'll plug it in, I'll plug the context input into it and convert the node input into a sequence evaluator to plug that in to the set sequence node. 
Next, I'll keep things simple for the time being and get a select node and plug that directly into the sequence. I'll plug in our should turn counterclockwise boolean into the index of our select node and I'll promote false and true to variables. False will be set to a turn in place right 90 degree variable. I'll do turn underscore r underscore 90. I'll duplicate the variable and replace the r with an l in its name and plug that into the true. So right is clockwise, left is counterclockwise. I'll go ahead and add these variables to the previously created idle variable category. Now that we've set a sequence, we will be adding more animations and expanding our logic so that we can turn 180 degrees as well as 90 degrees. And that will give us the same coverage as the Lyra animations in case you are following along with those as opposed to the UUS animations. And then I'll show you how we can expand the logic again to use the 135 degree and 45 degree animations. But first we're going to get this basic system working with the 90 degree animations and then we'll circle back around to add more animations to our selection. So next I'm going to get this sequence evaluator node and I'm going to set the explicit time of the sequence evaluator to zero. going to add a few reroute nodes in here to organize this graph a bit better. With that done, we can move on to our update turn in place anims function. We're using a sequence evaluator, which means that it is just choosing a single frame to play. We set that frame to zero with the set explicit time function, but now we need to do a few things, including advancing that frame timing. To start, I'll convert the node to a sequence evaluator, and I will set the explicit time of the sequence with a new float variable, which I will name turn in place anim time. We'll need to calculate turn in place anim time before we use it to set our explicit time. So I'll create some room here. And now I'll get the context and use that to get the delta time. And I'll add the delta time to our current turn in place anim time and use that to set turn in place anim time. So now we accumulate time and use that to set the sequence evaluator's timing. And the reason we do this with a sequence evaluator instead of a sequence player as we're essentially recreating the same behavior is so that we can track our turn in place anim time to start the recovery portion of the animation in the next state at the proper time. There's one more thing we need to do with this turn in place anim time and that is to set it to zero in our setup turn in place anims function. I just wanted to explain this variable and the purpose of it before I included it here to make things hopefully a bit easier to understand. With this done, we can move on to our turn in place recovery state where I will get a sequence player. I'll bind our turn in place anim time variable to its start position and I'll create a new animation sequence variable named final turn anim and I will bind that to the sequence binding of the sequence player. I'll turn off should loop animation on the sequence player as well and again we need to set our final turn anim value back in our turn in place entry setup function I'll go ahead and set that variable with the result of our select node in our logic flow here. I'm just adding a few more reroutes to try to keep things from getting too convoluted and hard to read here. If 
All right. I'm going to enter into our main animation blueprint and I'm going to go into the idle state and into the update idle state function that we've previously created. I'm going to create a new function in this animation blueprint and I'm going to name it process turn yaw curve. I'll set it to be thread safe and I will place it into our update idle state function. So this will be called for every frame that we are in our idle state. And inside of this, we are going to process our turn yaw curve value and use it to back out our root yaw offset. I'm going to get a get curve value node and I'm going to get the curve value of our turn yaw weight curve. And if this curve is less than one, I'll get a branch. And if it is less than one, then we're going to set a couple of variables here. One named turn yaw curve value and one named previous yaw curve value to zero. I'll create those now. And I'll set them so that they are floats. And we'll see how these are used soon. So if this value is less than one, it means we're in the recovery portion of our animation. So we're effectively resetting these values that we will be using during the active portion of our turn in place animation to affect our root yaw offset. Next, I'll duplicate this get curve value function and this time we'll get the value of the remaining turn yaw curve. And I'm going to divide this value by our get curve value for turn yaw weight. And I'm going to use a safe divide node since we do not want to accidentally divide by zero. I'll take the result of this division and use it to set our turn yaw curve value variable. Next, back before we get to our branch, we're going to set previous turn yaw with the value of our current turn yaw. Because we set this variable before we update our turn yaw curve value variable, we effectively save the previous one. Now we can subtract our previous turn yaw curve value from our current turn yaw curve value to get the change in the value of the curve and we will subtract that from our root yaw offset. And the resulting value will input into a set root yaw offset node. One last thing we need to do is to add a branch before we set our root yaw offset. And if our, and only set our root yaw offset if our previous turn yaw curve value is not equal to zero. Otherwise, on the first frame of the animation where there is no previous turn yaw curve value, then we'll back out our rotation and things will not align properly. I've gone ahead and selected two turn in place animations within our unarmed locomotion layers animation blueprint so that we can go ahead and see how the system is functioning with the progress we've made thus far. Additionally, for this to work correctly due to the way that the on become relevant binding is called we need to ensure that the transition from turn in place entry to turn in place recovery has a duration of zero. Because the same animation is being played, we will not see any sort of popping or quick change in pose. It'll just continue from where it left off. Otherwise, we could go from turn in place recovery back into turn in place entry immediately as we begin transitioning before we've left the state fully enough 
which would lead to a situation where this function does not get called and we do not select a new animation or reset the animation time, effectively freezing us in the final frame of the turn in place animation. So with this transition set to zero, the character will play as many turn in place 90 degree animations as is required as it will enter into the recovery state and then immediately back into the turn in place state. The final step now is just to extend out the amount of animations that our turn in place system has to choose from. Inside of our setup turn in place anims function, we have a single select node that we're using to choose between two different animations. We can extend this with a branch and I'm additionally going to collapse this into a function and work inside of a function just to keep things tidy. So I'll collapse this to a function named select turn in place anim. I'll set it to be thread safe and pure. And now, just looking at the branch, I'm going to go ahead and get a property access node and get the root yaw offset from the main animation blueprint. And the logic that we are going to run here is going to be true if we should choose a 180 degree animation. And we're going to determine whether or not we should choose 180 degrees by subtracting a value of 180 from our root yaw offset. I'm going to normalize the axis. So we essentially back out 180 degrees from our root yaw offset. And we normalize it to the range of negative 180 to positive 180. Which means that we can check to see if this the absolute value of this value here is beneath a certain threshold. The same threshold as our entry condition for turning in place, which is 50. So essentially what we're doing here is we're checking if an, an offset of 180 degrees takes us below the 50 degree threshold. And if it does, then we can select a turn in place 180 degree animation and return that. Our only other condition currently is 90 degrees. So we can simply return that like that. And of course we need to replace our variables. So I'll duplicate these two to create a turn in place right 180 and a turn in place left 180. With these created, I'll go ahead and drag them out. Compile. And now back in our locomotion layers, I will set up our next two turn in place animations. So turn right 180. And turn left 180. Now if we play, we will choose either a 90 degree turn in place animation or a 180 degree turn in place animation. There is a bit of a pop during our transition as we switch from playing one turn in place animation to another. We may be able to fix that by doing an inertialized blend, perhaps instead of a standard blend with the transition between turn in place recovery and entry, where we're going from recovery into entry. Let's take a look and see. That seemed to fix it. Awesome. Okay. And now we can just continue that process for every turn in place animation that we have. 
So after 180 degrees, we would have 135 degrees with the UUS animations at least. So we can replace that value of 180 with 135 and create more turn in place variables. Additionally, the UUS animation set also has 45 degree animations, so I'll go ahead and do a check for 90 and play 90 degree animations. And if each of these branches is false, so the branch for 180, 135, and 90, then we will play a 45 degree animation, which is what we'll default to as it is the smallest. I'll go ahead and place all of these back up into the idle animation set category. With all of these animations set, I'll compile and set them properly. So there's a 45 degree. That was a 90. Let's see if we can get it to do 135. I believe that was either a 135 or 180. It's going to choose the closest one, and if it needs to, continue to play some to get as close as it can. It will, as we just saw there. I'm going to go ahead and end off this video here, and we'll cover adding in an aim offset in the next video. It may be a shorter one, but I do think it deserves its own dedicated video, so that's what I'm going to do, and I will see you all there.